Hi there, and welcome to Tech Tip Teardowns. In this episode, we're going to take a look into an interesting piece of test gear, the Wobulator. So, let's check it out. The Wobulator that we're going to look at today is inside this really heavy aluminum box. Now, this Wobulator was used by the military way back in the 50s to field align radios. And, of course, you know, the Wobulator itself being a delicate piece of equipment, they put them in these really, really heavy aluminum boxes. And when I say heavy, this thing is ridiculously heavy. Uh, it really is a two-man job to move this thing around. And uh, somebody before me was nice enough to remove one of the handles on this side, so I only have one handle to move this. It's, uh, uh, to give you an idea, it's just um, absolutely ridiculously heavy. And, of course, the box itself is probably a very large portion of that weight. The box itself is completely sealed. It has rubber seals around the lid inside. And uh, basically, it's designed to take weather and basically whatever you can throw at this box. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this thing was uh, even designed to take parachute rides. So it's, uh, you know, extremely heavy. Uh, again, the, uh, the handle is removed from this side right now, so there really is no sealing of the box. But if that handle was on here, the bolt holes would be sealed. And, you know, of course, this thing would, you know, be completely weatherproof. It has some very, very large clips on the side that are like, you know, the, the big clips that you'd find on a large toolkit, except these are uh, ridiculously large. They've got uh, some very large springs that hold them, uh, hold the actual lid on. There's four large clips here to keep this nice and tight, and of course they need to compress that rubber gasket to keep the weather out. So I'll open the lid here, remove these clips, and uh, we'll take a look inside. So this is the lid here, and we can see these very large rubber blocks down here. These large rubber blocks are designed to wedge against these two handles here to keep this thing compressed and tight inside the case. And uh, there's a very soft rubber gasket that lines the lid here, which of course seals to this surface right here. There are also some very large rubber blocks right here on each side which keep this thing kind of shock mounted inside so uh, you know it can take vibration. The unit itself really isn't all that bad condition. It's uh, you know looking pretty good. Uh, a little bit of surface rust through the paint but I would imagine that's maybe due to this handle being missing and some weather getting into the side and I can see you know moisture getting trapped in this lid because it's you know other than those holes where the handle where this thing is uh, you know completely airtight. So what I'll do is I'll remove this thing out of the box and I'll put this on the bench and we'll take a closer look at it on the bench. This is the Wobulator out of its case and it still is a pretty heavy unit just on its own. There's a bunch of stickers all over this thing that gives us a rough idea of this thing's history. There's a piece of masking tape here with radar maintenance written in pen here and a mobile calibration sticker that says April 18th of 1958. Yet we have another sticker here that says May 7th of 1960. That seems to be the last date and it says calibration interval every six months. So we know that, you know, within six months of May 7th of 1960 is probably when this was last used. Here we have a log sheet to keep an eye on who used this thing. So basically they had to put the date used and the person that was using it had to put his last name on here. So if uh, an alignment went awry or if this machine failed, they could trace it back to the person who was using it and maybe even the, uh, the piece of equipment that this thing did an alignment on. Obviously, if this thing is out of alignment, the thing that this thing is aligning will also be out of alignment. So you need to keep a really close tab on that. Here's a bunch of service doors on the top. Really what these are for is just adjustments inside. We'll take a look at that here quite shortly. Here's a bezel that pulls out. So if you're using this thing in bright daylight, you can pull this bezel out so that it doesn't, uh, you know, basically cause any issues with reading what's on that CRT, right? These little CRTs were never really all that bright back in the day. So by having this bezel that pulls out, you can kind of shield the external light from, you know, interfering with what you're looking at on this screen. So really, what a Wobulator is, is nothing more than an oscilloscope and a sweep generator all in one package. So really, you could kind of look at this as a simple spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator, is really all this thing is. And this unit here has a really neat option of having a wave meter in here to do the alignment with, to put a blanking spot in the trace. And I'll get into explaining that here quite shortly. 
So what I'll do here is I'll reposition the camera here and we'll take a look in these little doors here. In order to get into the service doors, what you have to do is you have to put a screwdriver in these things and give them a quarter turn. They kind of just snap into place. So that's open. So I can open the door now, but you'll hear it kind of snap tight. And that's really what holds these things tight during transport. So with that like that, you can pop a screwdriver in here like so. Door's a little bit rough to get open. And inside we have all the coils that set the sweep range of this unit. So there's one coil installed right here, right now. I can pull this thing out. You can see, basically has an old tube base on the bottom. And that just plugs into a socket here. And under here we have all the other coils for all the different ranges. So to get at these coils, you pull this little clip down like so, and you just take this off. And these are all the different coils with all the different ranges. 30 to 60 megacycles, or in today's speak, that's megahertz. All right, so 19 to 39 megahertz, and so on and so forth. So it was, you know, really the highest range here, it looks to be from 47 to 100 megahertz. And it just has this little protective lid that slips on here to hold these all in place, again, during transport. So the little coil is down here, and it just plugs in. Basically, it's in a tube socket. It just plugs into this socket down here. In the back corner here is another service door. So we'll just stick the screwdriver in here and pop this open. They are a little bit stubborn. And we have all the settings for the oscilloscope here. So we have intensity, focus, vertical centering, and horizontal centering. And we also have a bunch of adjustment tools here. Looks like a bunch of Allen wrenches or Allen keys and two spare fuses under this door. In order to get this out of the case, it's got these really large thumb style screws. So basically all you do is you just unscrew these like this for very easy servicing and this whole unit will slide out of the case. And of course these doors will have to be left open or what's inside this would catch on those doors. So what I'll do is I'll remove all of these thumb screws here like so and I'll remove the case and we'll take a look inside. The thumb screws are all loose. You don't have to take them completely out. You just unthread them until they just kind of basically dangle in the hole. And then you just pull the chassis forward and the whole thing is ready to come out of the case. So before I actually take this thing right out of the case, I'll have to reposition the camera. So I'll be back. I have the unit removed from the case and we're now looking down at the top side here. This is the CRT right here. And this is that bezel that slides in and out. We can see the two rails here and the two guides for the bezel. So I'll pull the bezel forward and show you how that works. Below the bezel, we have this shield over the CRT and the shield is made out of mu metal. And what mu metal does is stop external magnetic fields from interfering with the CRT. The CRT under here is electrostatically deflected. So that means that it has four plates inside the CRT, two horizontal and two vertical plates. And by feeding a voltage to those plates moves the trace around. So it'll actually move the electron beam around inside the CRT and you'll see the trace move on the face. This differs from a magnetically deflected CRT. Now there's, that's kind of a catch 22. All CRTs are magnetically deflected in some way, shape or form, but they classify them as either magnetically or electrostatically deflected. So most scope CRTs are electrostatically deflected, whereas the older televisions with the big CRTs, those are magnetically deflected. And uh, they use a yoke on the outside of the actual television itself that sits on the neck of the CRT to, uh, to move the beam around. These are two filter capacitors for the high voltage supply for this CRT. These are 0.25 microfarad capacitors at 1500 volts DC. These are held down with two hook style retainers. And these hook style retainers have a piece of thread rod on the bottom of them and it goes through the chassis and there's a nut on the bottom. And what you do is you can see how they hook around the top of the capacitor here. You tighten those nuts down on the bottom and it just pulls the capacitor tight to the chassis. So the lead in wires are on the bottom side here. All the transformers in this unit are sealed. So these are two transformers here. This is a filter choke for the B plus. This is the main power transformer for the whole unit. And this other gray box up here is a selenium rectifier hiding inside. 
Now I'd like to power this thing up, but all the capacitors are bound to be bad. And I bet you that selenium rectifier is probably bad as well. So I don't want to take any chances and uh, burn out this power transformer. I'm going to do a restoration video on this entire thing here in the very near future. So uh, at that time, we'll go through it and then power it up at that time. But this is just really a teardown video and, and taking a look at how this unit actually works. This here is a wave meter in the front here. And what this allows me to do is if I'm looking at say a filter circuit or something with this unit, it allows me to put a blanked spot at the peak of the pass band on the CRT. And when I'm rebuilding this and we do some testing, I'll get into explaining how this works at that time. In fact, I'll just show how it works. That's easier than explaining how this wave meter actually functions. Now, most modern oscilloscopes have a sweep circuit inside them that moves the trace across the screen. All right, and that's done electronically. Well, this is earlier than that, and this is done with a motor. So this has a motor here with a bunch of coils in the back here and a magnet that moves around that causes the horizontal sweep. And there's also a capacitor under here that moves the oscillator around, and that, uh, that capacitor is like an old capacitor that you find in an old radio with plates, and it spins that capacitor around really, really fast to move the oscillator around. And I'll show you that in just a moment here. Underneath this here is a whole bunch of the tubes that cause this or make this whole unit work, and it's held down by those same clips. So I'll see if I can get this off here. I'll remove this cap off this rectifier tube here. Move that out of the way. And that one's really stuck. So I'll see if I can move that. Oh, that's really, really stuck here. I'll just grab a plier and uh, I'll move that out of the way. There we go. This is really heavily spring loaded to hold all the tubes down. And of course, all that spring tension was on that clip there. You can see on the bottom side of this, all the springs that are compressing. See there, that hold everything down in here. So this is the high voltage rectifier tube here for uh, the high voltage section for the CRT. We have a bunch of regulators here, some rectifiers down here, a 6SN7, which is two triodes at this point. I'm not sure what that 6SN7 does. And these here are all the filter capacitors. Now, the nice thing about these old units, what they did is they put these filter capacitors in sockets. Look at that, you can take the capacitor out and just replace the capacitor. So you'd read the rating on this, get a new capacitor and just pop it in. And uh, you have brand new filters in this thing. Now, unfortunately, you know, these things are unobtainium now. So uh, what I'll have to do is either restuff these when I'm doing the uh, restoration or I uh, just put capacitors on the bottom side of the chassis. I haven't really uh, decided what I'm going to do yet, but uh, I can pretty much guarantee that uh, most of these capacitors are all bad. And of course, powering the unit up with these bad capacitors is going to cause big problems and I don't want to do that. So that's how these uh, capacitors work. You know, what's even more interesting is that there's an X on the top of that capacitor and there looks to be an X on this one too. So that's already telling me that there's probably some bad caps. Maybe somebody was in here and checked this out previous to, to me here. So this is the cap that goes on that high voltage rectifier there. So what I'll do is I'll reposition this and we'll take a look at the side and look at that uh, sweep circuit. This is the side of the unit, and this is the sweep motor here and the variable capacitor here. So there's a flexible coupler in here that's kind of like a U-joint in a car. And I'll just show you that coupler right there. And what I'll do is I'll just turn this with my finger. I can really feel the, uh, the magnetic action of that magnet in the back here going between those coils. So it kind of pops in and out of position. Kind of like when you turn a computer fan, you can kind of feel how it kind of pops onto the magnetic poles there. This is the same thing. You can kind of feel it pop. You can see how it kind of moves on its own. Put it right there and it pops back into, into place here. So you can see how the capacitor in here, you can see how the plates are moving in and out. So this, you know, fully meshed there. And then of course it's wide open and then fully meshed there again. And this just spins around and this is what creates the sweep. So we have this moving the oscillator here. And then in the back here, we have these coils driving the uh, horizontal deflection circuit on the CRT. So kind of ingenious 
Again, before they did this electronically, this was done mechanically. This looks like a brush holder here for the motor. It's probably the carbon brush under here for the, uh, for the small motor. You can see all the old resistors and such underneath here, so that'll all have to be gone through as well. I imagine these tubes right on the top here are part of the oscillator circuit. So they're right beside this plug-in coil here. So what I'll do is I'll turn the chassis around and we'll take a look at the other side. One other little quick thing here just before I go to the other side, we can see two 6SL7s hiding here on the wave meter block. They're plugged in and there also is a, a piece of this, it's almost like a soft foam, rubberized foam that's pressing down on the tubes to hold them into place. So these, uh, these two tubes have got the JAN symbol on them and whenever a tube says JAN that stands for Joint Army and Navy. So they're pretty ruggedized tubes here sitting on this side of the wave meter. I'm on the opposite side of the unit by the CRT now, and these are two 6SN7 tubes here. That's V102 there. And this one up at the front is V101. Now I imagine that these are for vertical because they're right behind the input jack on the front here. So I'll have to check that out on a schematic if I can find one for this unit. On the back side here, I can see a capacitor that looks to be like a Black Beauty, but it's a brown in color, so I wouldn't trust that at all. That will have to go. And down here, I have a whole bunch of capacitors. This is one cap here, another cap here, another cap here, and another cap here. And these are notorious for shorting out and failing. So those are going to have to go too. I know a lot of people seem to trust these. They think that these last forever. Well, let me tell you, this thing here alone this Lavoie Spectrum Analyzer right here was loaded with them and I think every single one of them was bad. There was a lot of capacitors in that Spectrum Analyzer to change. So I don't trust these and I've also had bad run-ins with these capacitors and AR88 receivers and things like that as well. So there's a bottom panel on this. So what I'm going to do is remove all the screws on the bottom panel and I'll be back. We'll take a look in the bottom side. Well, not a whole lot to see in the bottom, except some tube sockets in the bottom side of the capacitors and the transformers. This here is the attenuator box on the front of the unit. Those little push buttons that we saw are really just a big push button attenuator. So nice big shielded box there. This is the bottom side of those capacitors here. And uh, these are the bottom sides of those capacitors that I was telling you about that have the stud that come through the bottom. You tighten the nut and then it pulls them down. That's these guys right here. More of these caps, a few more of them up here. Some variable potentiometers on the face and the fuses down here. Not a whole lot to see, but there's one very, very nice thing that they've done. And they deserve five stars for this. The schematic is on the bottom lid. The full schematic for the entire unit. That was an extremely nice surprise. So there it is. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just position the camera a little bit better and we'll take a look at the schematic. Wow, what a nice unexpected surprise to find such a nice schematic in the bottom panel of this piece of test gear. Be nice if all manufacturers did that. It looks like they put some form of a protective coating on top of the paper too. That might be the reason that this has stayed so nice. So what I'm going to do is take some high res photos of this before I put this bottom panel back on. So the two 6SN7s that we saw on the top of the chassis by the CRT are the vertical tubes. So that RF input jack that we looked at on the front goes into a potentiometer and directly into the grid of V101A, which is a 6SN7, and it gets amplified and runs into V102A, which directly drives the vertical deflection plates of the 3BP1A CRT here. So we can see that these run off to the uh, vertical deflection plates. Down here we have the sweep oscillator motor. This is the oscillator motor and this is the magnet between those two coils that drives the horizontal deflection plates. You can see it goes into this transformer here and this transformer goes directly off to the 3BP1A horizontal deflection section. We can see that this shaft here, this dotted line, represents the shaft and it runs up here to that variable capacitor that we were looking at that was uh, on the other side of that little universal joint. There's two parts to that capacitor, and which makes it a butterfly style variable capacitor. So we can see that 
one of these capacitors is on one side of the 6J6 and the other capacitor is on the other side of the 6J6 RF oscillator here. And that was on that little sub chassis just above that butterfly capacitor. We also have a 6AQ6 automatic voltage control tube or AVC tube. And that 6SN7 that we didn't know what was amongst all the capacitors and rectifier tubes is a multivibrator. And you can see that ties directly into the AVC circuit right here. The two 6X5 rectifiers also in those uh, in that bunch of capacitors that unplugs is the uh, the uh, one is a bias rectifier and the other is a high voltage rectifier. That large choke that we looked at on the upper chassis is right here. These are the two 0D3 voltage regulator tubes that we saw right here and right here. This here, are, this section here, is the wave meter, and this is those two 6SL7 tubes that we saw that was kind of pressed down under that rubberized foam on the other side of the chassis, also very close to this butterfly-style uh, capacitor section by the, um, by the sweep oscillator motor and everything. This here is the attenuator unit. We just looked at that on the face. That's that brass-looking box. That's this entire unit right here. And that really is how this whole thing works, really quite simply. This here is the CRT, and of course we have all the adjustments here, the vertical centering, horizontal centering. These are just variable potentiometers. And uh, down here we probably have, yeah, there's the focus control right there, and so on and so forth. So not, you know, a, a very complex design at all. It's really quite simple. So when I go through and actually rebuild this entire unit, go through it and uh, recap it and check all the tubes and do that, we'll go over this again here and I'll also sweep a filter circuit or an IF section or something with this thing. I'll find something to do with it and uh, we'll see how this unit works in its entirety. Thanks for stopping by and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Tech Tip Teardowns. If you did, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more teardowns of all sorts of bizarre electronic gear just like this in the very near future. So take care. Bye for now.